traffic. Um, um, I think what we'll do, is, let me just let, make sure we're letting people in, is we'll, we'll go um, around the room first and do some sort of quick introductions. Um, and then um, I will, um, and then maybe we'll sort of kick off the conversation until the, the, mini the minister comes. So, um, Helen, do you want to sort of say who you are? And yeah, of course, apologies yeah. to those on the on the screen. No, <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm Helen Undy. I'm the chief executive at the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute. So we're a, a research-led organisation looking at the link between financial difficulty and mental health problems. So pensions is obviously a really big factor there. And we are just kicking off a big research project looking at the pension experiences of people with mental health problems as well. So I'm delighted to be invited today. Great. So Matt Wood from the Government Actions Department. Uh, we're uh, actually a consultancy within government, um, uh, a focus on, on helping, helping government with all sorts of financial risks. Um, and pensions are obviously a, a big part of that. Great. Yeah, I'm Gail Isa, mm -hmm. I'm Managing Director of the Workplace Business at Standard Life, which is part of the Phoenix Group. So obviously our workplace business, we're passionate about pensions and broader financial wellness and uh, Phoenix Group in particular have got a real interest in uh, later and better longer lives. Great. You know what I might do is slightly move the television so you can actually see the <laughs> colleagues in the corner. It feels okay, just, you know, very, very professional here, we are. Um, <laughs> but it feels like yeah. that's a bit yeah. better, yeah. isn't it? Now I'm that's very good. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, right, now God, that that's yeah. sorted. Um, I'm Victoria Pinormo, um, I'm from Hyman's Robertson, we are a, a consultancy, UK based consultancy, but I'm from the DC team, um, we have a big focus on whether members are saving adequately for retirement and helping employers understand that, um, that's going into areas of gender pensions gap and uh, also other gaps in, in savings uh, in the UK as well, really important that we get those messages yeah. across. Great. Hi, I'm, I'm Sophia, I'm a senior economist at ILC, and I've been doing a number of research projects here, so mainly kind of looking at the longevity economy, so estimating the economic contributions of old adults and making the case that actually it's a huge contribution to be made rather than focusing on kind of more negative messages. Um, and also kind of thinking about more relevant today, the retirement prospects of Generation X and future generations and what we can do to better support their retirement prospects. And I'm Emily Evans. I'm the newest member of the team. Um, as such, at the end of April, I'm communication and, and engagement officer. And my background is in education, so I'm very interested in the work for tomorrow and um, making jobs, you know, enabling people to work for longer in all sorts of Great. workplaces. Um, and thanks. Thanks. Um, and I'm David Sinclair for the um, Chief Executive of ILC. I suppose as a as a quick intro, and um, I'm I'm going to pick while we're waiting waiting on the minister. Um, um, pick on Jackie Wells. Uh, Jackie Wells has done a little bit of thinking and work with us on. Um, you know what's changed over the past 25 years and what might change um, going forward so I'm going to give Jackie a couple of minutes before I bring Jackie in um, to, um, so, so she knows so she has at least um, uh, a couple of minutes to think about it but um, sorry Jackie. Um, the um, so this is the first event um, we've done since the um, since the death of our founder, Sally Greengrass. And actually, I just want to say we've been really, really humbled by the response, both from the UK and across the world. We've had, uh, you know, those of you, many of you will know we're one of 16. So we have 60, another 15 ILCs across the world. We have literally hundreds and hundreds of comments and actually really, really lovely. I think one of the things that's really come across really strongly is actually... Uh, you know, which I wasn't, well, I, I should have been expecting, but actually was actually, you know, how kind Sally was to everyone she met. So, you know, irrespective of the, um, you know, her, her impact, which I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a bit, a bit more, actually, the general sort of kindness to people, you know, is, is one of the things that people have really reflected back on us. Um, I, I've been very lucky to work with Sally for about 15 years and, um, and and when Sally uh, Sally set up ILC twenty five years ago, um, and um, 
when others would have retired. So she set it up at the point at which she retired from age concern, you know, so others would have retired, she set up another organisation and ran it for 25 years. So, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, I think it says quite a lot about her. And actually, up until the day before she went into hospital, she was due to do a parliament oral question in the House of Lords. Um, and she spoke in the Queen's speech the debate just a couple of weeks before. So remained very, very active until um, pretty close to the end of his life. Um, we feel very privileged to have known, known Sally. And I suppose um, for, for, for us here, clearly really important for us to think that we take forward that legacy. And Sally was very keen that ILC was not a, um, an organisation. Um, can I just ask? If there is anyone not muted to mute, um, we have we have some building work in the background. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so, um, so, so, yeah. I, 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 Sally was always very big on us being a future organisation about us not being about focused on older people, um, and, and instead actually being focused on the impact of longevity on society. Um, um, we had a big conversation with our uh, chairman and colleagues uh, and trustees around whether we should cancel this event and I think we felt that Sally would have been really, really cross if we cancelled it. She'd have like been, you know, what you've got a minister coming to the office, you can't, you can't cancel, you can't cancel it. So, um, so clearly, clearly we couldn't. Uh, um, Sally was really keen to celebrate the 25th anniversary and that's what we wanted to do here um here today and to be starting to think about right, actually how have things changed over the last 25 years really really like to have some friends here in the in the room um as i said earlier we're using a sort of um our attempt to you know the the technology allows us to do this in a quite clever sort of hybrid way which may or may not work but i'm grateful for all of your patience um, um and, and apologies if, if if things do go wrong but please do as I say mute yourself um, I think we're hoping that if you um, if you raise your hand um, we will um, you will appear somewhere on the screen so we will be able to see see you but equally if you put something in the chat we should be able to see, see that that um, Sally was really really passionate about um, age diversity and when, when how Hello. I, how, yeah. have a seat. Thank you very much. Thanks. Would you like any coffee? I'll be proud yeah. of me, I'll give him one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so we're, uh, uh, Jackie's got, Jackie's got, and an, uh, Jackie's relieved, I'm not going to ask her to do an impromptu couple of minutes. Um, hi, Guy. Um, just to finish the sort of intro, Sally, really, really passionate about age diversity and age neutrality. And one of the things we really wanted to do today is that actually a lot of these debates, um, no offence to, to colleagues in, in the audience and indeed is uh, tend to be focused around, um, I, how do I say it's that, you know, there's a lot of conversations amongst middle-aged white men uh, around pensions. <laughs> and, and actually what we were really keen, ILC has staff um, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and up until last week, 80s, you know, there were only 10 people, you know, actually, it strikes me that what we need to be doing is thinking about the, you know, the, and I tried to convince my 15 year old child to come in, you know, I, I, that was a step too far, um, but, but actually really, really keen to sort of have a conversation across, across all generations, um, at which point I'm going to, uh, can I pass over to the, to the minister, is that okay to yeah, sort of, of do this intro and kick us off uh, by all means yeah. so uh am i talking to the camera yeah, or am i talking, talking to, to you guys camera. okay i'll, I'll don't, don't, don't take it the wrong way when i look the wrong way but i'll do a bit of both because yeah. i've got this so um it, it is an honor and a privilege to be here a great sadness obviously uh, about the baroness and mm -hmm. um it is uh, it's right that i sort of mark that to start with and i also note that the what i'm being asked to speak mm -hmm. on uh, in any way, this is not humbling, the vision for the next 25 years. And my wife um, said to me, are they expecting you to be the pensions minister for the next 25 <laughs> years? Because you've aged quite a lot through five years. And so uh, the tweet that I've just put out is a gag before anybody um, uh, imagines that uh, successive governments are going to be having me into my dotage, which it did seem to me appropriate as a man 
aging fast in his 50s that uh, we should be talking about sort of how we're going to bridge that gap. So I have a 10 point plan over the next 25 years and I'll list them and then you can all dissect and uh, give me a hard time, um, which would be uh, the first would be automatic enrollment. The second would be small pots. The third would be rainy day savings. The fourth would be pensions awareness. The fifth would be simpler statements. The sixth would be dashboard. The seventh would be super funds slash CDC. The eighth would be consolidation. The ninth would be fuller working lives, midlife MOT. And the tenth would be charges. Uh, so all I can say is whoever is the lucky person <laughs> who does this job for the next 25 years, that would be my manifesto for change. And I was going to try and walk you through where I think those 10 points will be and what I'm trying to do to achieve them. And obviously, I have highly detailed notes in my <laughs> speech today. But so I will do this slightly off the cuff, but I hope also that um, that'll be taken for the uh, spontaneity and the, and, the, and the better way rather than I have a very lovely speech prepared by the department, which I don't think is appropriate for me to give. So on automatic enrollment, I, I've written the word 12%. I consider it, I gave an interview with the Sunday Times two weeks ago. I consider it utterly certain that we will get this to 12%. I take it as read, we will do the 2017 review. Clearly um, COVID and other things have got, and the, the rises to national insurance uh, have got in the way of that in the short term, but that will happen without a shadow of a doubt. Um, obviously, everybody gets very excited about when, how, what, but both of those things will happen in my view. Um, clearly, it is a question of how you drive that forward, but at the very least, problem seems to be utterly certain. The second, well, that's the feedback. Um, the second issue is in relation to small pots, and um, I'm looking forward to meeting Nick Sherry today from Australia who uh, are very much where I'm looking to try and find solutions on small pots. It is clearly the case that whoever does this job, however we deal with this going forward, with the miracle that is AE has going to have to grapple and then legislate for probably uh, in the longer term, if industry can't fix it, the problem of small pots. And that will, in my view, involve some wholesale consolidation in some shape or form. The third issue, which is, not technically my portfolio, but that has never bothered me in the past. And it is something which I'm delighted to see that you're raising today is rainy day savings. Uh, I call it rainy day savings. And I've just done a very big event with Nest Insight, uh, which some of you I know were there. And it seems to me utterly wrong that pre-pandemic, 10 million people didn't have uh, the 100 to 200 pounds saved. Post-pandemic, we don't have the stats, but go figure, it's not that great, so I'm sure. And that whilst I am the Minister for Pensions, I fought tooth and nail that financial inclusion should be yeah. included. And it's a great uh, honour that I'm the first minister to do that. I sometimes feel I have not achieved what I would have liked to have achieved in that. But then again, it's a very young child, if you know what I mean, in the sense that if you look at AE after five years, you'd be going, well, it hasn't really got that far. And now it's a teenager and everyone's get, we're getting into its teens and everyone's starting to go, OK, well, we can develop it and move things on. Similar with financial inclusion, uh, the work that John and I have done at Treasury to, first of all, get Treasury and DWP joined up, which I think is, I can't overstate how much that matters. Uh, the second is to do the financial inclusion policy forum and slowly but surely look at individual and very chunky things from you know, mid-cost credit to high-cost credit to how you can drive forward maps and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel very strongly that we need to get a situation where we have default 1% one, 1 savings that uh, is taken out of pre-existing pay. It's not a situation where you'd be giving enhanced pay, but you would be, be a, you'd be creating a 1% savings uh, pot, which very quickly would build up uh, the sort of cushion that everybody wishes to have. Now, clearly some companies, and there's like seven out of the FTSE 100 are doing this voluntarily, uh, we're encouraging more to do so. Clearly, there is a sidecar uh, trial that is ongoing, and you know, all credit to the likes of BT, Timpsons, and Glasgow University. But it would seem to me that uh, within a relatively short period of time, we should have rainy day savings as a de facto default policy. And I'll add one interesting, really interesting tweak, which is 
I've gone to lots of companies lately where they have said, we offer this amazing pension package, but we really can't recruit young people. And I'm going, well, if you speak to young people, what they're really interested in is, first of all, if you're a bloke, it's mainly buying a car. Mm. And if you're a couple, it's definitely buying a house deposit. So if you change that and have your uh, uh, effectively your default uh, AE package as your default package, but you add on savings as part of the sign on package, it's amazing about staff retention mm. and the difference that makes. Whereas 22 year olds, 23 year olds are not that keen yeah. on a uh, excited by or enthused mm. by a 10 to 15 percent pension package. But they are mm. enthused by a 8 to 10 percent pension package with a 5 percent uh, savings on top. That and, and staff retention, that's really interesting. And the, the, the work mm. in there is, is it's ongoing. Uh, the fourth would be uh, pensions awareness. Um, clearly, we've done a huge amount of work, whether it is on the what was called used to be called the statement season i was very keen on uh, after much discussion by industry who hated that uh, for a variety of reasons we won't go into um, we've come up with a pensions awareness campaign that is very much kicking off this uh, autumn builds upon the great work of the pension geeks scottish widows should be mentioned because they definitely have led the way um, but i also have not given up a situation where it seems to me that you have to find a trigger point that doesn't affect business that could potentially be utilized to drive forward real engagement with your pension. And probably the one that is the best one is a birthday um, event. Mm -hmm. So in other words, whenever you have your birthday and they're all they're spread across mm -hmm. the year, so you wouldn't have a situation where business would be swamped by something happening mm -hmm. on the 1st of September, you would receive your statement or statements and you'd then be in a position that you could then go, all right, so uh, seven days, oh, sorry, I've touched uh, the wrong thing. Apologies, that was entirely me. Um, and you could then be in a position that you could actually go, well, seven days after your birthday, you'd receive this and you go, OK, fine, I can then make some plans. That, it seems to me, is a work that we need to do look at longer term. The fifth is simpler statements. It is, I defy anybody, and I've tried to get anybody to explain a pension statement to me with sufficient clarity that they could say, genuinely, <clears throat> does your mum, your dad, your grandparent really understand this document? They don't, is the honest truth. And as a consequence, we are reforming that in the short term. I regard that as a long term journey. And we are in a position that we will uh, clearly start this October with a simple statement. But that should be, in my view, something that should be de facto uh, across the board. And we are going to obviously we've started with DC, but we should roll this out across the priest so that pretty bluntly, the consumer understands the product they've got. You would never consider any other product whether it was a house sale or your bank account or anything that was so incomprehensible as the present situation and the industry have created such a situation. The sixth would be dashboard. Clearly, this is a, uh, I will have on my gravestone the man who finally got dashboard over the line, I hope, um, <laughs> if, if I make it that far. Um, but put it bluntly, democratising uh, pensions, bringing it into the 21st century, helpfully jumping the 20th century, Putting something onto your mobile phone, your laptop, your iPad has got to be the way ahead. There are um, inundated with people who want to put add-ons to it. And I mm -hmm. fully get that. Let's just get the product over the line. This is the single biggest computer project, effectively, that the government is doing, and the mm -hmm. the logistics of it are Herculean. Um, but we slow, we make slow but steady progress, and I, I genuinely believe that forget about 25 years, but within five years, we will have a very, very cool dashboard that will be utilized on a massive basis. And as I've discussed many times in the past, you will be going on the bus, chatting away, moving your money from your bank account, your savings account, your pensions, mm -hmm. consolidating, doing everything you do. How democratizing that is, is in my view, mm -hmm. off the charts. The seventh would be super funds and CDC. Both are projects I've championed the last five years. Both are difficult, uh, you know, the logistics are not simple, but on any interpretation, super funds are, in my view, uh, the way ahead and we, we will get that over the line. There are huge issues that we've managed to uh, engage, uh, particularly with the PRA, but it, it is, we're making progress. We have Clara of the line, we will get others soon, I believe. Um, and similarly with CDCs, you know, it is clearly something that arose out of amazing work by um, the Transport and General Workers Union and also the Royal Mail. But CDCs is not going to be restricted to Royal Mail. I, I personally think that CDCs, if if everybody, if we can embrace it and, and develop it and um, roll the pitch, to use tremendously bad 
terminology from yes. politics. Um, <laughs> if you could roll the pitch, that CDCs is very much the future on a multitude of levels. I genuinely believe there is an opportunity there, I really do. And certainly when you speak to my Dutch colleagues, it was very notable that they thought we were heading the right way on that. Um, the eighth would be consolidation. We have way, way, way too many funds. And in my view, wholesale consolidation is the way ahead. I will be looking forward to speaking to my Australian counterpart um, this uh, morning. But, um, you know, you, in 25 years time, what will we have? Well, I mean, bear in mind, the Australians now say that I think it, I'll get the figures slightly wrong, but in broad terms, 30 billion is the smallest and minimum size fund that they expect to have. Now, we are light years off that. Clearly, Nest and Peoples and others are all very substantial, but they're way away from that. But you ask in five years time where we're going to be, we're going to have very substantial funds. I finish on the last two, which would be um, and it goes to your point about this is a lifelong learning point. Um, the department have done a thing called Fuller Working Lives, and it was a superb paper when it was actually written, but it wasn't necessarily embraced as part of sort of government policy as I would have liked it to have done. And it merely it, it amounted to making opportunities for people to work post retirement age, trying to make sure there was lifelong learning. But there's been there's lots of small stuff in government which you know never makes the news so the orga review the sort of lifelong learning the work that the dfe are doing really really does make a difference i promise you so that you know people are now uh, as famously i tell the tale of the midlife mot from aviva with a nice gentleman who aged 71 was retraining to be an actuary um because he could work from home make a very good five five figure salary and only have to go to work once every six months by and large. Hmm. Now, that to me was entirely use of muscle memory, capability, working part time, doing stuff that wouldn't have been the job for some time. The Midlife MOT, my challenge to everyone here present is that you'll be aware that I received about, not personally, obviously, but the government has, has the chancellor has said, look, you can have just up to five million to really roll out Midlife MOT. Hmm. And that five million is made up in three ways. And I'll finish in about two minutes, just so on timings. It is made up in three ways. There's an online version, which we're working on with MAPS, which DWP and MAPS are together. Secondly, there is the use of the job centers. We are, have a massive footprint around the country and we're trying to help people uh, change jobs, move jobs, improve their particular outcomes. But finally, there's the private sector led stuff. And it seems to me that you guys who've done a lot of work on midlife MOT, should be thinking how can we partner up with a commercial provider mm -hmm. to do one of the three pilots that we have got out there i'm i'm genuinely i my door is open ultimately i have to commission and spend taxpayers money on showing midlife mm -hmm. mot as a in, in in a sort of private sector led um uh, project and the plan the plan is really simple and again it goes to the sort of 25 year point i hope the five year point which is um post the general election, which is probably going to be the 1st of May 2024, in my view, but what do I know? Um, but post the general election, a, a minister like myself or my successor will have will be able to say to the Chancellor, look, with Midlife MOT, we have proof of concept from the likes of Aviva. You guys looked at it. Other people have looked at it. You then have the LEP trial that we did last year, which we spent uh, £400,000 on which was small but significant and showed you a bit of what we could do. We've now got a five million pound proper pilot project of which we've got the following learnings. How can I then take that intervention and democratize it amongst the whole population? And there are a variety of ways you would do it, whether it is a tax break to enable individual businesses to sign up to that, whether it is a employee benefit that you in fact, you can discover it is something benefit to the employer, but there's a whole host of possibilities. But the chancellor can look at that and then say, "All right, there is a problem with post fifty or forty five uh, wealth, work, and well being. All three need to be looked at. It's in our interest that people are healthy in their fifties and sixties and debt and get the interventions they do, because yeah. otherwise it costs the state a huge amount." We yeah. want people to be working and happy and productive. It's good for their mental health. It's good for so many other things and it reduces taxes. And thirdly, we want them to have a better retirement and their understanding of their retirement is not necessarily what it should be. And my last one on this very back of the envelope, very impressive 30 year plan is on charges. I defy anybody, and I'm very unpopular when I say this, who can genuinely price compare the charges on pensions 
that exist at the present stage. Now, I bow to all of my predecessors who are very bright, very wise, and Lord knows they keep telling me that, um, that they have done a system, particularly on automatic enrolment, that allows three different types of charges, which are utterly incomparable. Um, if you had any other product in the entirety of the Western world, uh, in the modern system that you couldn't price compare, you'd be going, this is ridiculous. I accept entirely that will mean compromises, complications, and some people will have uh, upset about this. But putting it bluntly, do I think in 10 years time, there won't be some price comparable um, charging systems? Uh, yes, I absolutely do think that. Um, yeah. Forget about 30 years. Now, that is not something that you're going to do before the next election. It will require legislation. Mm -hmm. It's going to require a lot of consultation and it will require some broken eggs because this is a properly difficult omelet. But so in a gallop through in approximately 12 minutes, and my apologies um, for not giving the sufficient detail to some things I probably should have done, that would be my 25 year vision. And I'm certain I will be held up for the things I've admitted out of it, but I hope that assists. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Guy. And I sort of, yeah, really strong. We, we had um, someone from the UAE's Prime Minister's office at one of our events and they've just, um, they're introducing a 50 year plan. And it's sort of, <laughs> um, but, but that's great. You know, one of the chal real challenges we have with ageing is that actually we've been ageing very slowly in the UK, we've been ageing over 300 years. And actually it's really hard to get the political impetus for, for, for change. And it strikes me that actually one of the big challenges for government is how do you create that when the problems are, are you know, are actually are there, but, um, but, but but potentially not as urgent in as in countries like you know Korea and Hong Kong and Singapore where people are aging very very rapidly. But really struck by the comments on work as well. And we we've done some Sophia's done some really interesting work that shows if you keep people healthier, um, they work longer, they volunteer course, more, yeah, they care yeah, more, yeah. and they spend more. And 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 actually, it's interesting. I was talking to senior economists who are much cleverer than me who are saying actually for the first time central bankers are starting to get worried that older workers aren't going to come back to the workplace. Okay. So it strikes um, me that the five-year... Government, year... government is worried about yeah, that. You know, yeah. You know, I mean, the UK government would like... Um, there, if you look at the stats, and the stats are unarguable, post-COVID, there is a significant mm. cohort of uh, above the age of 50 who were in employment who have decided not to return to employment. Mm. Now, yeah. There are a myriad of reasons for that. Some of it is long COVID. Some of it is um, uh, the particular job circumstances. But um, we need to crack that. Yeah. We need to crack it for the UK economy. We need to crack it, in my view, for the majority of them. They don't quite grasp and understand the extent to which they're probably going to live some considerable period of time. Their retirement <laughs> options are probably not as good as they think they are. There's a whole bunch of that. And I just touched very quickly with that. I don't want to monopolize things, but you say that governments are worried about mm. this. So uh, I'm, I'm having fasc fascinating conversations with my opposite number in China, mm. who you think we have issues. Mm. Trust me, they <laughs> yeah, are yeah. seriously concerned. They've got this ginormous um burgeoning middle class yeah. who are aging fast yeah. without any retirement provision Absolutely. and then uh, my hope is that i'm doing a trip to china and japan yeah. um in the autumn because the japanese are the best in my view from what i have read i have not you know experienced it personally they're the best at understanding how do we harmonize older age with community services with healthcare, with yeah. you know everybody is almost encouraged to do the voluntary service for their local community because it's so good yeah. for them and because it gives back everyone is encouraged mm -hmm. to do exercise in a way that too often those of our, our colleagues and friends in the 60s go my form of exercise mm -hmm. is lifting a pint in the pub and yeah. and there is a whole host of different interventions that are almost like they're almost like accepted common practice you know what i mean and they mm -hmm. hence why they live a lot longer Brilliant. No, no, great. Let me first bring in um, people here in the room if anyone wants to, to come in and ask any questions or comments. Got my, yeah. Can I just come in on? So I like, I like the idea of uh, for younger people, you, you have a kind of savings product alongside yep. pensions. Um, I'm kind of wondering why it has to be separate though. So um, what, 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 what it feels like we could really do with is, is a product which allows people to buy a house early on or put the deposit down on the house early on and then morphs into a pensions vehicle um, almost like the auto enrollment style where people have 
accidentally started saving because it was being taken out uh, and then they mm. didn't get around to opting out or, or however yep. you see it. Um, but it feels it feels like the way you were describing it, there, there were different products that saving. Um, and and I, it, I, I feel the best way of getting people to continuously save is, is to be, build that habit and then it just changes a bit more organically. And I realise I'm kind of describing the lifetime ISA. <laughs> for some reason that hasn't worked. Okay, it's really easy. I'll tell you why the lifetime ISA is not working and why automatic enrolment works. It's very, very simple. The great British public, any public, don't do stuff unless you have default. So, yeah. it, so you know, sidecar yeah. savings is what you've just described. So sidecar is, I save into my auto roll pot, I have a sidecar that pops over into mm. savings. Brilliant idea, beautiful product. If anybody wanted to do what you just described, they should clearly do sidecar. The take up is around 1%. In other words, the, the great British public, unless they are nudged into this, um, just aren't taking up and you're right Lysa is a phenomenal product and my treasury colleagues never stop telling me how amazing it is <laughs> but not enough people are doing it mm-hmm. and so at some stage the state has to decide are we happy and you know this is a proper intervention policy are we happy with a situation where the great British public are not saving therefore we either create an amazing product that you can buy into Lysa is a great example with phenomenal tax breaks and phenomenal you know anyone who was thinking about it should do that but they don't um so if that's not working and you've got this amazing product and it's not a tradition so it is in america the 401k is like so inbred into the americans to the self-reliance and they've got to save themselves we don't have that frankly so if it's not a fundamental tradition does the state step in and say well, you know uh default savings is the way ahead and the, my one comment would be um, any pensions minister who in any way suggests you're going to start tampering with AE and the POPs and the way it's working tends to get monstered by everybody from the FT downwards to the entire sector who get really, really stroppy and really, really, you don't know what you're talking about. So and I think there's a degree of truth that, you know, just leave the pension be um, and just encourage the other. And I agree with you that is the way ahead. I would say, although not a product from a sort of from a provider perspective, it's already we, you have to offer things more than pensions. So that's when we surveyed younger people, it was absolutely a house and um, how to manage day to day finances yep. and how to manage debt. So that means that our solution. So one of the examples we've got a I think a home buyer coaching tool. So we actually mm-hmm. talk to people, gives them a kind of guided journey where they can learn actually all the skills mm-hmm. to buy a house because you've got to um, you've got to start to, I think we believe you've got to help people with short term goals so they build confidence and competence. And I think the other one is the digital. Um, so again, what, what we found is our app is overtaking the dashboard. But once somebody downloads our app, they're eight times more likely to actually engage. So you get mm-hmm. people start going in multiple times. Yeah, the old so, gag is, you know, I'm old enough. Some of us around this room are mm-hmm. old enough. Others, you two definitely not old enough <laughs> to have actually met our bank manager. Right. Who was this? A nice, crusty old person in the mm. bank. We would go and walk into and actually have a conversation with. No one does that anymore. But of course, all of us who have a savings and banking app, we chat to our bank manager all the time. Yeah. Pension yeah. firms that have this, they're chatting with their customer way more than they ever did when they had a nice man who drive around in a Ford Mondeo <laughs> and go and visit you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. um, so Helen from Money Machine. I know you would. Um, I thought it was polite to remind you, you need me. <laughs> um, so I really like your 10 point plan. I think it's really nice. And I, you know, we often talk about and we talk at the Financial Inclusion Policy Forum quite a lot about the fact that people with mental health problems, the ways in which mental health problems affect how you earn money, manage yep. money, engage with your finances, mm-hmm. means that to some extent, in a very crude way, you can kind of use the research on that and those experiences a bit like the kind of canary in the coal mine for everybody else that like if it works for people with mental health problems it's likely Mm -hmm. to be better for everybody because you've got statements that are simpler you've got products that people can understand those kinds of things and I think your 10 point plan really delivers that I I'm sure you've thought about it I hope that underneath all of that there's a kind of (laughs) testing of all of this not for the average consumer but for the consumer with additional needs the thing that I would probably add to your 10 points, and I think 10 is really neat, so I'd probably slip it into point number four and combine it, <laughs> is um, around advice. 
and particularly so we're just getting <clears throat> underway with our big piece of research looking at the pensions experiences of people with mental health problems and one of the things that's come out really quickly is their experiences so they're more likely so we're all likely to have multiple small pots but they're more likely to so you're more likely to be changing jobs have periods out of work yeah. likely to have lower comprehension so actually understanding of so that statement that might arrive on your birthday is a lovely idea but i'm more likely to need additional help to understand yeah. that and have a conversation about it but the bit that I think is really complicated is to also more likely to retire early and to retire early at a point when they're unwell yeah. with their mental health. So going to have to make some quite complicated decisions about a smaller pension fund at yeah. a point when they're less likely to be able to do it. So how you get advice and guidance to people at that point that is suitable for somebody who is struggling. Um, so that's the only bit I'd really like to see sort of pulled out a little bit more is that hand holding and so i would love you to engage with my lovely colleague mims davies mm -hmm. who is running the job center version of the midlife mot okay. um and clearly there are an awful lot of people going to job centers some are i've left my very well-paid job and i'm moving into something else and i'm in a in a gap you know grace coffee is three times the same benefits as she explains you know mm -hmm. she's the secretary of state for dwp but there are also a lot of people who are very complex needs who are going to job centres who are trying to find uh, what, what's the way ahead. Sorry, I, I lent back. It was a mistake. I apologise. <laughs> yeah. um, who are who have very complex needs and who are needing an awful lot of support on the, the UC journey. I think there is a real opportunity to look at because we're already doing a trial on exactly mm -hmm. this point. There's a real opportunity for yourself and your organisation to sit down with MIMS and say. As you're doing this pretty much up and down the country, can't we make one particular area somewhere where we really look at how we can develop policies for everybody, not just for uh, middle aged white collar people who are very uh, secure and understanding of all their options, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I do feel that the midlife MOT is an intervention that would assist, um, particularly because, as you rightly say, some people will not make it to retirement age before they are considering their long-term future. You know, I had a brain tumour at um, less than 50. I'm not a great mm -hmm. bet to be living to 90, retiring at whatever. Uh, there's a huge amount of other, many of my patients in my ward, clearly we're not going to make it mm -hmm. that far. So that would be my first suggestion. The second is, surely the reforms of small pots fix that, because how, how I kind of envisage that reforms of small pots take place is that, yes, all of us would have had a job at McDonald's when you were at university or this for doing this or whatever, and you pick up your 11 pots over the years. Fine. And then we lose track of them. Dashboard clearly helps, but government steps in and finds a consolidator model that brings all those pots together, probably with a default option, which says, you know, if you don't say something, we are going to do this. Now, there will be some people who drift, therefore, suitably nudged, basically, by government and suitably looked after by government into one consolidated pot. Mm -hmm. How you then manage that and whether there's bolt on support and things like that, I do agree with you totally. The bit on advice and guidance that you raised as well, I would, the only thing I would say is that um, clearly that is a... A, again, it's not my portfolio, so that's always mm. quite complicated because Treasury run yeah. advice and guidance. Um, I also slightly want to, uh, I feel it's very harsh to, it's a bit like, uh, I'll use my words carefully. Um, we, we really just set up the money and pension service, uh, which everybody agreed was the right way ahead mm. to set it up. And it's like a three-year-old child, you know, um, it's, it's so recent, I actually created mm. it. You know, that, that's how recent mm. it is. Um, you have to give it a chance to develop and um, formulate policies to look after everybody. And it has got a specific uh, obligation under section 16 or 18, I can't remember, uh, subsection D, that says you have to look after the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And um, that clearly would be those with mental health issues. That clearly would be those um, who were disabled those you know there's a whole host of people who come within that that strata now um letting mo money and pension service develop real long-term policies that cater for white collar blue collar uh people of um special needs people with mental health yeah there's a whole host of things 
is going to be a journey. And mm. I, I slightly, you know, there's a great, my dad has a line, which is don't buy a dog and bark yourself. So if you set up an organization specifically to address these things, mm. allow it to get on with it to do that. And whilst uh, doubtless the Work and Pension Select Committee will tell me I should be managing them better to do X, Y, Z, at the same stage, I'm, I feel like I've got to let them get on with it and try and do that. They have a statutory requirement to do so as well. But obviously, it's a work in progress we need to look at. It. It's a good time. I mean, it's a good time to be doing the research and we'll make sure oh, that our research has some practical things I, for maps. Come, also, come to us with, you know, and everybody knows that government, the nation, mm. has lots and lots of problems. My, my, my mantra is always come to us with solutions not with problems because we know we've got mm. loads of problems you know I, I could have given you another 10 things i'm mm. trying to solve um and you know those who come to us with to i say to the ilc you know mm. get involved with the midlife mvt trial yeah partner up with oh i can't think of a white a very substantial uh, provider like standard life possibly <laughs> partner up with a big provider <laughs> yeah, yeah. who yeah. can then actually give you some clout and reach in a way you don't but at the same mm. stage come to us you know, help solve the problems because yeah. they're out there we all know they're out there do you think on the guidance is it because i guess we our hypothesis you could do much more on the guidance but it's quite a it's quite a um you know a, a sort of narrow band before you get into yeah, advice sorry. so actually yeah. do you think is there an appetite to to look at that and so I, the... I, I have lots of conversations with providers and organizations not dissimilar to yourselves who come to me and PLSA and ABI and others and who come to me and say, we'd really like you to fix advice and guidance. And I say, that's great news that you want me to do that. I'll put that on the wish list. But my, my serious point is, right, what does it look like? How does, you, you tell me how I amend statutory legislation and what, who runs this? How does it deal with it? Who does the insurance? Who's regulating it? Because uh, the one sure thing I know is that I go to a pensions or a savers conference and I say, stick your hand up if you love the FCA and the TPR. Very few people yes, stick yes. their hands up, right? So everybody agrees that the regulators, government, have got stuff wrong. And everyone goes, oh, if only we're in charge, we'd do it better. Fine, I, I accept that's a perfectly legitimate comment and criticism. But then come to us with what it really looks like. Yes, so my, my slight is that instead of saying to government, this is a really messy problem, you fix it right uh, and slightly this is the situation i could give in every pensions context why is government doing dashboard because the, the pensions industry wouldn't do it why is government doing lots of stuff because the, the industry wouldn't do it if you really want to fix advice and guidance come to us with what this looks like who regulates it go and redraft the legislation it's not difficult to hire some good lawyers um lord knows um, they send me enough stroppy letters as it is um <laughs> But and then come back to us for this is exactly what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what an enhanced guidance model looks like. And then you genuinely you can then sit down with Treasury, who ultimately run it, and FCA and Nikhil Ratty and others and say, all right, what, what's so wrong with this? Because an awful lot of very bright people and some pretty expensive lawyers have gone that, gone to the trouble of actually really doing your job for you. Um, road test this yeah. well listen if i if i stand like the <coughs> fc but on a serious point we are working with them in their sandbox mm. i think we find that quite a useful sandbox is good but um my my take mm. on five years doing this job is um everybody likes to chat about stuff mm -hmm. and I, I i welcome it and i you know engaging with mm. stakeholders in inverted commas mm. uh, what does the real change look like and you tell me how i pay for it who you know, which levy pays for this? Does the yeah. taxpayer pay for it? Does the member pay for it? Who regulates it? Who insures it? Uh, all of those really dull nuts and bolts is what yeah. we have to it's consult on and drive on. We, we've been, uh, I was talking to colleagues yesterday about sort of, you know, the, the ongoing conversation we've had about sort of the case, of whether it be a, a pensions commission or an ongoing retirement income commission. And I was saying the same thing, actually, that actually we shouldn't just come to you and say, we need one. We need to say, what does it look like? What does it do? How does it do that? How, who, what sort of powers it, you know, because actually just saying we want it is probably not particularly helpful. Because and also the, the I mean, uh, pensions commissions are vital in some areas, you know, automatic enrollment would yeah. not have happened with that. We, that's yeah, patently yeah. clear. And some of the reforms to the state pension, although I'm clearing up a few yeah. of their complications, I wish they had looked at sure. at the time, but never mind. Um, but almost everything I've just listed, yeah. I can do. Yeah. All right. Uh, I need treasury for rainy day oh. savings, but pretty much everything in that list 
yeah. I can do as a minister or my successor yeah. or yeah. some much wiser and greater person can do. I don't need a pension commission to do that. And, you know, raising automatic enrolment levels, clearly you'd engage with business and treasury and do the full what's called right round and everything like that. You wouldn't necessarily need to do that. I think, um, David. So, oh, yeah, sorry. David, may, may I come in, on with, in with a question that relates to this? Yeah, just just let me bring Sophia in and then I'll bring you, but anyone else as well. But if anyone virtually wants to come in, raise your hand and I'll bring perhaps three or four in at once, if that's all right. Sure, right? sure. So it's, uh, bring a couple more here. So Sophia and then. Uh, okay, yeah. so really quick. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, really great plan that I think will make a huge difference to many and I really like the kind of rainy day savings point. I think it's really important our research supported that. I was just wondering um kind of with that within that rainy day savings point is that kind of an idea for the self-employed? We know that the gap in pension savings to them and employees has widened in recent years and that's not being compensated by non-pension savings. So we're really concerned about that. I think there's a huge opportunity potentially to automate the sidecar savings scheme for the self-employed. I'm not sure how the big challenge how is it done in practice. But I think that would work. That our research, you know, I think an yep. idea like that would work for that, that group. Um, I think the twelve percent ideas are really, you know, would would make a huge difference. But for many, you know, maybe we could do a bit more as well on top of that. Um, potentially tapping into opportunities where people kind of have fewer affordability constraints. So, for instance, the IFS and our research did show that. You know, when people buy um and paid off the mortgage they're not actually saying saving much yeah. more into pension I remember the um also other points in their life and i'm just wondering you know it wouldn't cause too much harm but maybe yeah. we could do a little bit more in those moments um in fact i think the point that matt talked about buying a house and being up and others you know there is a growing trade opportunity buying a house and saving to pension i was just wondering with your thoughts of whether kind of the scheme could kind of yeah encourage people to buy a home and then maybe up pension contributions once they've done that because they'll be saving and uh, paying less on on rent and housing costs okay. so mm -hmm. let's make some opportunities there can i bring a few people in yeah sure please i'll just yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and yes. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick and uh, uh, yeah. remind me of your name again victoria, victoria. victoria. Oh, oh, it is yeah um, so top of your list was auto enrolment and uh, along the theme of not bringing in more problems and bringing in a solution yeah. instead um one of the one of the gaps i think is being in the workforce in the first place. So I'm thinking specifically about women that are taking time out from their careers in order to be carers at home, to put it, you know, kind of simply. Um, there are about two million women in the UK right now in that situation. So that's 15 percent. Um, auto enrollment credits, I think, is the solution for that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've, we've put out um, a letter, I think that went to the select committee recently. Um, there's also some engagement within the industry, but I think that's a, that's a, a, a real concern and a, and a real solution for you as well. Okay, so uh, let me do those two together yeah. and, and then, then we'll, we'll go, we'll go on that. Yeah. So uh, let's do the easy stuff at the end, Victoria. So the own credits, I'm really curious to see the international examples on that. Um, mm -hmm. So there is quite a lot of evidence in Scandinavia and the likes where they are beginning to look at this and some countries have done stuff on that. Um, it's really tricky, though, because it requires wholesale reform of employment law. Again, let me bring in another government department and <laughs> post COVID and huge issues with the Department of Business. You know, there's a whole the, Matt Taylor's report is still sitting on a shelf. Some bits have been um, incorporated. Others haven't. Some have happened organically. It's complicated because there's a whole bunch of. Uh, employee rights, changing uh, company law. There's, it, there's the principle is as always with these things. Good. The practicality is interesting. How it's worked in um, practice abroad is something that I would be, you know, if I was still doing this job in five more years, that's something I would put on my next post 2024 guidance of what what, what sort of things guys should be looking at um, on gaps in workforce. What we appreciate that it's a clear issue. You know. I'm, at the moment, I'm struggling to get the 2017 review over the line. So, you know, trust me, I've, I, I, I can't tell you what efforts we're doing to get that over the line. Um, none of which is publicised because obviously everyone just has a pop at me. But mm -hmm. um, uh, that's but, you know, we have to play the cards we dealt mm -hmm. economically, but both of which are both legitimate on the housing stuff. It is complicated. I promise you it is. And um, 
uh, journalists love to have a pop at me the moment I even discuss this, let alone mm-hmm. even I'd say on one occasion I asked someone to send me a paper and then I got annihilated by the FT. Thank you, Joe Cumbo. Um, and uh, as always, it is difficult. But yes, I do genuinely believe there is going to be an issue with an ever larger population who are short of a deposit, who are going, how is it that we're going to save this? I think the rainy day savings, in my view, is the start point on that. And my, the evidence I see from business where that's offered as a sign-on package to 18 to 25 year olds, it's gold dust. And their, their staff retention that happens because of that, rather than I train someone as an apprentice and then they, I train them up and then they move on, mm-hmm. is fascinating. If I give them their housing or rainy day package and that's part of it, they all stay with me. It's really interesting. And I suspect business will eventually drive this change. And that would be the way ahead. In terms of self-employed, you're right. I probably should have included that in the 10. Bad guy. Um, <laughs> my bad. Um, it, it is a work in progress. The, the, we're waiting on one thing, to be perfectly honest. And I speak as a uh, self-employed jockey. Very bad. Didn't save much. And a self-employed lawyer for 20 years. White collar. Classic self-employed. Totally <laughs> hand by mouth. Um, always nine months behind being paid. Uh, thank you, the state. And um, <laughs> always, therefore, wondering how I was going to do this. And, event, and, and the only way it worked was the drop down box in mm-hmm. my tax return. Making tax digital has been delayed, but that is the clear way ahead on a whole. Mm-hmm. And so I've met with the Permasec of HMRC to try and say, look, as and when making tax digital becomes a reality, and we're about a year away from it becoming a reality, clearly self employed. Um, it is the way ahead. There, there has to be a system, mm. and I speak as someone who's done twenty something mm. years self-employed before I got a problem. Uh, but when I had a proper <laughs> job, I should say, um, it has to be the way ahead. Great. Can I bring in um, Ben and then Tom and then Alex? Thanks, David, and thanks, Guy. Great ten points. I hope you get as far as you possibly can with all of them. Um, to your point on solutions, can I just um, w- the DWP has put out the welcome consultation on improving people's understanding of pensions options. And I know you've done a lot of good work on this. On the birthday triggers, that is fantastic. There is industry interest in taking forward an industry-led trial of the auto appointment approach guy that you and I have discussed before and which many other people have expressed support for. Um, would Thinking about the good work that Ruston did with you that helped, helped Ruston Smith in relation to simpler statements, would you would you and your officials engage with an industry led project of the auto appointment evaluation to see what what impact that could have on trying to get people to impartial guidance at useful points in time? OK, next question. Um, so, Tom. Thank, thanks, David. Morning, Guy. Um, so it's, it's outside your wheelhouse, Guy, but you've already said you're happy to go there. So um, pension taxation. Um, so many problems, whether it's on the normal minimum pension age and small pots or getting doctors to come in for work because of the annual allowance or getting people to understand the tax incentives for saving for retirement. Um, there's a huge amount of appetite across the industry to address pension tax issues. It's a really thorny issue and we understand the government's really kind of reluctance to go there. What would your advice be on how we could actually create a context where meaningful reform on pension taxation could be achieved? Okay, Max and Alex. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm slightly um, uh, out on a, a different limb here. I'm in the pre- university press are interested in post state retirement age working, and I'm trying to find data on it. But uh, in traveling in other countries, I find that. Um, particularly in areas where people live long and healthy lives. The concept of retirement um, is, a, is a lesser one and people keep engaged in the workforce in some form or other. And I just wondered whether um, the factor of um, no cliff edge retirement is there where you know it's sometimes called stepping down. And I would add that the public sector in my view is possibly the worst offender because the, the number of people employed, for instance, over 70 years of age in the public sector, I doubt you will find any. Whereas McDonald's, for example, are more engaged in employing older workers. So I just wondered if there was any data on, on the nature of post-state ret- 
the post uh, state pension. Those three. So the answer on the post state retirement working stuff is that there's loads of stuff on DWP research. Um, and I, you know, you probably want to look at the retirement outcomes review as a start. Um, there is a bunch of DWP research that uh, has definitely been done. Um, and I, I utterly endorse the fact that, you know, we want to keep people working if they're healthy post their state retirement age. I think it's good for them. There is no doubt whatsoever. And uh, again, one of the reasons I'm trying to go to Japan to learn from them is exactly that. They do that better than virtually anybody else, in my experience. Um, and certainly that's the, that's the, the intel I get. Um, on pension taxation, Tom, I suppose what I, I, I'm asked about pension taxation probably more than anything else whenever I do any conference. And I'm always remarkably struck by how poor the industry is at making the case for change. And I would say that they are, uh, I'll probably really choose my words carefully, that for, for an organisation that seems so keen to do reform of pensions taxation, they seem singularly unsuccessful in ensuring there is uh, pension taxation reform. So my take on that would be, is that what does this look like? What practically does that actually look like? Now, there is a, there is a separate thing um, in respect of uh, doctors and high earners. I could say if I'd stayed as a barrister, I would be in exactly the same problem because I'd be earning well in excess of a million pounds. I'd be white collar, I'd have all my weekends and I'd have a pension issue uh, that would be clearly a very significant issue for me. But in reality, um, that, that, that cohort are particularly looked at in their individual nature. So there is very a lot of work being done on those particular cohorts. Consultants is the obvious ones that everybody's trying to do. Um, the, the, but again, slightly, get together as a group, identify the three and four changes that you would genuinely seek to say. You know, the tax man, the, the, the chancellor and Lucy Fraser, who's the tax minister, will first of all say, all right, what, who's gonna pay for this? What, who are the losers? Uh, what is the fiscal cost of the taxpayer? Uh, you know, once you've got those answers and you can actually identify them, then you have a much more amenable uh, approach, in my humble opinion. As to Ben's point, we, we have debated this quite a lot. I, I, I applaud you for trying. Um, the, uh, the only thing I would say is as follows. So um, we're not going to be doing uh, auto, uh, auto appointments for pension-wise, which... I, uh, I, can I just check? The offer was for an industry-led one, not for you to do anything. It's, it's bear, bear with me, just bear with me. <laughs> um, we're not going to be doing an auto appointment for pension-wise, but at the same stage, um, if, the if, if the industry wants to go away and to trial, um, uh, individual uh, uh, changes to the way in which they send out statements such that it is linked to people's birthdays and then interventions that follow by that, that is something that I would welcome. All right. right. So, um, you know, the, the, the long journey that sees me on simple statements and ending up in the pension engagement season, and I meet the PLSA and the ABI today, is that I basically take the view and I don't think anybody disputes this, that the degree of engagement by uh, an awareness of members of what they've got is just not good enough. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one would go to say it is in most cases very poor. Um, now, that has to change. It particularly has to change in a world where we're moving to DC and mm -hmm. we're requiring individuals yeah. to make lots more. Mm -hmm. And you know, to take Helen's point, and particularly got to change when some people are less uh, capable of understanding these things and other people. So um, make it all really simple, make it online, make it accessible, do some defaults to make things better for people. But pensions awareness and engagement has got to get late years better. Now, I would have liked for the statement season, but I accept entirely that is something that would have been expensive, complicated, hard to manage, and everything like that. So uh, we are engaged in, and we have a bunch of money that the industry is raising. We at DWP are trying, trust me, there's a fun games to get my budget organized on this, and it's, it's convoluted. We're trying to augment that with what DWP is doing to try and basically have a season this autumn where we really try and engage people in uh, their pensions and their awareness and their understanding, their engagement with that. I, I think that's a work in progress, frankly. And, but 
have I given up on the idea of finding, well, look, loads and loads and loads of statements are sent out uh, by providers on a regular basis. There, I mean, some companies do it in a particular way at, at a you know end of year or a particular month or whatever, because they make it a thing. But by and large, there is no rhyme or reason to when these things are sent out. Um, trying to link it to an event, the obvious one is your birthday, uh, would seem to me negate any problems of the companies being in difficulties on this, but also would be in a position that it would actually then say, oh God, I'm now 45 or I'm now 50 or I'm now whatever. Now is the time to have a look at the following things. And uh, it particularly follows dashboard in my view, because if you're able to uh, link that to an existing dashboard, you're able to turn around and say, all right, you have got seven pots um, because you've got every, every provider sent you their birthday statement. And you're thinking, oh, my God, I've got seven pots. But it, if, if it says on each statement, you can consolidate if you go here and this is what you can do. and This is how you do it. And this is your link to dashboard. Then you're starting to get into real change, in my view. Great. I'm really conscious of your time. You, I'm good. I'm good. You, you I'm okay good. For, yeah, I'm good. good. Uh, for another few more minutes. Great. I was late anyway, so that's my fault. <laughs> um, can I check on that? So can we show you our trial? By all means, you can do whatever you like, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Great, there's an offer, offer Ben. A any other sort of questions from the audience virtually? They're all stunned Never known, silence. yeah, I've never known, never known. Um, we're quite keen to end this because this is the yeah. hottest room. It's Any very, very, very hot. Hot. And okay. Anyone who's wearing wool is yeah, regretting his no, 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 Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. Um, well, why don't we sort of, you know, really, I'd like to say, I think the birthday, you know, ILC, one of the things we do is all of our staff get their birthday as a day, extra day off of holiday. So, of course, they can use that to read their pension statements. I kind of envisage yeah. that basically people would send, the, you, you, yeah. basically, the birthday would be the trigger to the provider. Yeah. They would pop it in the post. You'd go off and have your cake and everything like that. Two days later, thank you, post office. Yeah. You when you the hangover is worn off, yeah. and you are suddenly coming to terms with the fact that you're another year old, older and you've got a few more wrinkles yeah, yeah. and the odd grey hair, you would actually then have all right, okay, let's have a refresh. Yeah. No, but no, brilliant. Can I, can no, I raise one final things, thing, which yeah. is uh, I applaud your organisation massively. I would love you to be part of, particularly Midlife like and Matty, uh, and that we are we're genuinely looking, and our, our door is yeah. open. You know, it is a very rare thing that I actually have a budget to yeah. spend and millions of pounds of budget yeah, yeah, yeah. to spend that the taxpayer is inviting you to come up yeah. with paid solutions great uh but you've got a bid for it and there's yeah, a commissioning yeah, yeah. process and i i have I, trust me the process great. is convoluted to say the least <laughs> it is nothing like running a business but uh i have to do tenders i have to do and it's perfectly properly because it's taxpayers money but i cannot overstate it would be something that um you guys have got real expertise and if you can find the right partners Absolutely. then in my view the, the door is open but obviously uh, i don't i don't ultimately right. determine these things no, no, but that applies that's... also to those online who represent others equally august and large companies uh yeah. who genuinely want to be part of the solution and I, my my take on it as well is that um th this is a journey because some of these policies will be very very substantial going forward Whoever is in government post 2024 is going to need to have interventions for the over 50s in, in terms of employment, wealth, work and well-being. All of those things apply. It doesn't matter who's in government, whatever the political party is, whoever's minister. And this is really part of the change. And I genuinely think it's the way ahead. Brilliant. No, no. And I, I really take from your, you as well, your point around solutions focused. I think yeah. Yeah, we absolutely have to do that. I should also say we have ILCs in Japan and China. So in fact, I'm, we're doing an event with the British ambassador in Japan in a couple of weeks time. I'm so not actually, yeah, so we can, we must, um, we can also feed in some of the it, connections. It, I, we have I would, I would just say well. that it's hilarious that you say that when uh, I've done the job five years and I didn't know that. So <laughs> I would love yeah. to. No, you would love to come along and I will definitely and we can definitely introduce you to Perfect. lots of people in this okay. case. Um I, I, perhaps just to finish big thanks to Emily. This I, Emily's first first event she's now so very, very grateful to Emily for, for pulling all this to, together and to, um I also partners, we've got Phoenix Gad, 
Um, hi, Vincent Room. I see we've got Legal General on, on the line as well. Thanks, Helen, for joining us as, as well. Um, and, you know, you put that midlife, we're, we're also talking with um, Phoenix around lifelong learning and actually the importance of getting policy right in this space. And I think engaging, um, engaging with us all across, you know, in, in a world where we can learn anything on YouTube, but actually where we choose not to, um, they're thinking about actually how we how we support ourselves to, to learn throughout the lives is really, really extraordinarily important. Um, and then the final thing to say, it's our ILC's 25th anniversary, we have our big Future of Aging conference this, this autumn, um, really for everyone online and here we're still keen to have your ideas and we're developing our own vision and to finish on the tech point, we've just done a bit of thinking around um, sort of, you know, how the world has changed with technology and of course, you know, back in 25 years ago, we used to have those discs that you'd plug into the computer, it'd take forever to connect into the, in, into the internet, but you also had a, a point where uh, 25 years ago, um, uh, both um so bill clinton sent two emails whilst he was president and apparently al gore did have a computer in his office and sent lots um but but actually you think we couldn't now file our tax returns and you think actually how the world has changed over 25 years and and that actually the the opportunity for that in this space to transform how we engage with money is really really important so um thank you guys for joining us thank you all here on and those online for being thank you right bye we're gonna get you off now <laughs> what